Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's my great pleasure to be here with the Dr. Eadses, Mike and Mary Dan <laughs> Eads. And uh, we're going to wait just a few minutes for people to get on the live. But again, what a thrill. Uh, this, uh, it, my teachers, uh, you know, they, they don't know that, but I'm going to tell them that, of course. And and then also a little frustration I had some years ago. But, but anyway, I'm Dr. Eric Westman. I'm a professor of internal medicine at Duke University, past pr president of the Obesity Medicine Association, and still in practice, you know, loving how we can reverse metabolic disease, improve people's lives in a medical setting without medications. And I'm just, again, going to wait. Uh, I have a few hellos from, from Mexico, from uh, all over. And I've, yes, there will be some questions, time for questions. I get the first few. I, I have the first few questions, but I would like to leave a lot of time, uh, if that's okay with you two, to do some questions okay. from the audience, um, if they're not too hard. <laughs> that's <laughs> just the easy um, ones. <laughs> oh, gosh. You guys have... have have answered so many questions, including in the course. And I have to say, we're going to end up uh, on the live today talking about the protein course that you've put together. And it's my great pleasure at the Adapt Your Life Academy to be a part of this, to get this information out. So uh, again, welcome. And I'd like to dive right in. I, um, in 1998, when two patients came to me at the VA hospital in Durham, North Carolina, they lost weight without me doing anything. And, and I had sent all my patients to the dietitian, and no one seemed to lose weight. But these two people came to me having lost over 50 pounds on their own. Can you imagine the nerve? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't need a doctor. And so I asked them what they did. And, and you know, they politely told me that they read a book. And, you know, the book was written before you were born. And, and that really got my goat. I, I started learning. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I went out to read the books that they had read. And one was Protein Power that you guys wrote. One was the Atkins Diet Revolu New Diet Revolution that was really mm -hmm published. And, and you know, I was trying to learn on my own without any nutritional training, without training in weight loss, which is kind of the norm, even today among doctors. But when I was looking around, Dr. Atkins was the only one in a clinic. And so I didn't contact, I just, I confess, I didn't contact you because you didn't have a clinic anymore. You had already retired. <laughs> and, and I, so, but, but I learned this is 1998, and I think you, anyway, um, what I'd like to do is start out with how you got into this and uh, how uh, what I finally learned is that you had the, the clinic uh, experience, which I required. If I was going to learn from somebody, I wanted to learn from another doctor. And so I, I'm sorry I went to Dr. Atkins' office <laughs> instead of yours, but it's only because you'd already retired. And But if you think about it, that was 25 years ago. Yeah. And you guys well, at least had retired from the clinical practice. And, you know, you look like you're, you haven't even retired yet. So <laughs> fantastic. it must be the, the protein eating and the, the low carb living. So there, there are enough people on. Uh, th welcome, everybody. Uh, and we'll get to your questions in just a minute. But so please tell us uh, how you got involved in this, where your practice was, how long you practiced. And uh, it, because I think that's just a wonderful story. Well, <laughs> we it started with a kernel of popcorn, we, <laughs> which was me, <laughs> which was him. <laughs> Ever we, seen popcorn? And I, like that. Yeah, yeah. I had been I had been thin really all my life, and then all of a sudden, in my kind of early to mid thirties, I just exploded into obesity. I mean, I wasn't morbidly obese or anything, but I was way, way larger than I wanted to be and than I ever had been. And so I started fooling around trying to, you know, fiddle with my own weight loss. And I ended up um, while on, working full time as a doctor, yeah, while working full time as a doctor. And General at, practice. at the time, we had developed one of the first uh, chains of what are now called urgent care centers anywhere in the country. And we did that in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we had four of them. And at that time, you know, there were some some hostility with the medical community because they thought we were stealing patients and 
And, you know, it was just anything new in medicine is sort of automatically greeted with hostility. <laughs> and so we had these four clinics and suddenly I was overweight and they were had basically just turned out to be kind of four family practice clinics where you didn't need an appointment. <clears throat> but I was working in one. She was working in one. A couple other doctors we had worked in the others. And then we filled in with other locum tenens doctors. But during this time, I had all of a sudden gained a lot of weight. And so I started, uh, um, I got one of these fasting programs that you could do in the clinic. And I went on it myself and I lost all this weight. And when I read uh, all the materials that came with it, it, it said that, uh, you know, it was kind of reminiscent of Dr. Atkins' book, which I'd read years before. The first one, not the, the first new one. one. <laughs> right. And yeah, when I yeah. saw that, and then at the end of the, thing it said you need to go back on a low fat you know high carb diet and I thought well, what kind of nonsense but you know if this works so well on the front end why wouldn't it continue to work and so meanwhile I went back on a, just a regular whole foods diet but during this whole thing patients had seen me lose weight and and they wondered how I did it and wanted to do it and I started saying well you know, I can help you and started working with them and feeling my way through it and um and that's kind of the beginning of it. And then once I switched myself over to this whole food, low carb diet, I thought, what do you need all the, the shakes and everything? Let's just go on a, on a low carb diet. And so I started putting people on, on low carb diets. And this was during the time when everybody was scared to death of cholesterol. And so and that, that, of course, is, yeah, the first question on everyone's lips, well, what's going to happen to my cholesterol? And so I, you know, checked their labs and their cholesterol really almost in 100% of the cases did better. And so I started really looking in to kind of the, the mechanism of weight gain and obesity. And, and I went back to my actual medical school biochemistry book and I went through all the diagrams, I lined everything out and it became pretty clear that that insulin was a driving force behind it. And that, you know, insulin made you fat, insulin kind of kept fat in the fat cells. And so I decided if you can lower insulin, you know, you ought to lose weight. And the only way really you can lower it is with a low carb diet because there really aren't any insulin lowering pills. You've just got to take away the stimulus. So that's what I did. It I makes such success. sense. <laughs> yeah. And I had a pretty good success and I still had this niggling doubt because of the cholesterol and the fat issues. And then all of a sudden, just, I mean, in the space of a short period of time, four patients came to see me that, that really changed the way I thought about everything. The, the first one she sent to me mm -hmm. from her clinic, and, and it was a lady that was uh, mid-30s yeah, lady, and she had triglycerides of about, I don't know, 2,500, which is the highest I'd ever seen at that time. And so high that you really couldn't determine some of the other lipid parameters. And so we, uh, I took her on as a, as a test case because I figured, you know, she's premenopausal, chances of a heart attack are really negligible. So I'm going to go full bore with her and put her on, you know, steak and salad. And I talked to her. Well, the first thing I did when she came to see me was rechecked her lab because as you know, there are a lot of screw ups on labs. And when I saw something that out of whack, I wanted to recheck it and make sure it was a legitimate number, which I did and it was. And so I put her on a basically a steak and, and green vegetable and salad diet. And, and green vegetables right. and cheese. And cheese, yeah. <laughs> and I actually gave her my beeper number because I was kind of concerned about it. And I said, call if you have any problems. And I, and I had her come back in three weeks. She came back in three weeks, she had done great. I rechecked her labs in three weeks and her triglycerides had virtually normalized. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't believe it. They were 100 and something. Like yeah, that. yeah. And uh, and all of her lipid values were apparent. She felt better, she had lost weight. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me some confidence. Another lady who came in, um, and this was just at the beginning of statins. And this lady came in and her, her total cholesterol was 700, which I, I don't think to this day I've seen another one like that, but her total cholesterol was 700. And she was an elderly lady and was the mother of a friend of mine. And so I talked to her about the diet and she went on it. Same thing. I rechecked her in a few weeks. Everything had normalized. And then I had kind of a, a famous Little Rock person come in who was a female. Same thing. She, her lipid values were out of, I mean, they all came in because they wanted to lose weight. 
but in her, but their lipid, these are people whose lipid values were kind of crazy and her lipid values completely normalized. And then the final one that came in was actually a friend of mine who ran an ad agency who was about 58 years old and was going to just needed an insurance physical. So I did that for him and checked his blood work as part of it. And, and he uh, said, and by the way, while I'm here, how can I lose this little pot belly? Not much and, of one. Yeah, not one, much of one. And so I kind of told him to diet and he went away and I got his lab work back. I think he came in on a Thursday or Friday, got his lab work back, came in over the weekend. I saw it on Monday and his lipid values were out of the through the roof. Yeah, <laughs> yeah through the roof. And so Except I thought, it's HDL. So, I, it's you know, so I called him, I called his office to say, hey, let's talk about this diet. Because he was a middle-aged male in the age bracket that can, you know, prone to have a heart attack. And uh, they said, oh, well, he's gone on a cruise. He'll be, he's going to be gone for 10 days. And I thought, okay, he's, he's on a cruise. He didn't start this diet on a cruise, so I'm safe. When he comes, I said, tell him to call me the minute he gets back. When he gets back from the diet, he calls and says, hey, what's up? And I said, how are you doing? He said, great. And I went on this cruise and I followed your diet. The whole thing, it was really easy. I ate a lot of seafood, a lot of meat. I avoided all the other stuff. It was great. And I've lost, you know, three or four or five pounds, whatever it was. And I said, I told him about his lab values. I said, let's come in and look at those again. And when he came in, this was 11 days later. This is the soonest I've ever checked anyone. And when he did, they were completely normal. And then I started reading a little bit more about statins and a little bit more about the cholesterol pathway, which I, of course, memorized in biochemistry and immediately forgotten. And I realized that HMG coenzyme A reductase, rate limiting enzyme in the, the cholesterol uh, synthesis pathway and the same enzyme that statins block actually um, is stimulated by insulin. So it made sense that if you lowered insulin levels, you were going to take some of the stimulation away from that enzyme and that, that uh, lipid value should normalize. And once I had those patients under my belt, then I was fearless. And so I, I put everybody on the program from that point on and have never had a problem. Yeah, that so so Mary Dan, were you a little harder to convince? Oh no, actually I was yeah. I was fairly convinced because you know he had written he had written a book uh at just about that time based on our the the protein sparing modified fasting program that we had done because we saw so many people in all of our clinics, people would come in to be to be rechecked on this program that he was doing and and uh, they all did so well and it sort of occurred to him mainly that um, the the need for weekly monitoring and and all of the cost of those programs, which was thousands and thousands of dollars, um, you know, for for monitoring on them, uh, was was maybe not as necessary as it had seemed, because everybody really did. If they followed the instructions, they did really well. And so he decided, you know, people could do this on their own. Uh, and how much, how many people would that open it up to who can't afford it, can't possibly afford a hospital-based program or even a clinic-based program? And so he wrote a book, his first book, actually, without me, the only one he's written without me, um, that was called Thin So Fast. And that came out in 1989. And it told people how to, how to undertake a protein-sparing modified fast with a slight modification. We gave them one food meal at night. Uh, we'll make sure that they had enough fat to keep their gallbladder working and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, he, um, he wrote that book and, and we'd seen a lot of good success. And then when he started doing just the full um, food only program, uh, those four patients for me too, that was okay. This is, this kind of runs the gamut. It's men, it's women, it's at ages that we should maybe worry about. And everybody's doing really well. And so it gives you a lot of um, um, confidence uh, since like, like you, we didn't get any medical nutritional <laughs> training. I mean, I think we had one class in med school that was a three hour class. And I don't mean a three credit hour class. I mean, a three hour lecture, one three hour lecture. And beyond that, uh, what you were taught to do is write orders. Put this patient on a low fat diet and send it to the dietitian or, you know, dietetic service, you know, put this patient on a low cholesterol program or a low salt program or whatever. We knew nothing about nutrition from our medical training and all of it came just digging it out uh, paper by paper. He spent 
you know, half his life, it seemed, in the medical library back in the in the stacks, because, you know, in the olden days, when <laughs> in the very olden days, there was no such thing as this Internet I hear yeah. talk of where you could just with the click of a few uh, stroke keystrokes, uh, you know, pull up every paper known to mankind. And that wasn't the way it was back then. Well, you know, so um, you're most known or uh, in uh, the pop culture with the book, The Protein Power. I think it, it right. sold millions of, of copies. And mm -hmm. what I love about that is when I think about nutrition, how to teach it, the first place I start is to let's consider what we're made of. You know, what is a mm -hmm. human made of? And, and so occasionally I'll, I'll ask medical students or residents or visiting doctors just to see how much they know or don't know, you know, what are, what are humans made of? You know, and I'll point to the muscle and the bone. And, and <laughs> yes. sure enough, a, a student recently looked at me and, and said, what we're made, I th we're made of sugar. <laughs> oh my Lord. So, so yeah, you can't expect the, the <laughs> but, but so if you just start with the brass or the, the basics of what are we made of protein and we need to yeah. eat protein, the brilliance of the name protein power has really stood the test of time. A lot of people, you know, there were often the fats and the keto, this keto, that, and although I named our clinic keto medicine clinic based on the, keto metabolism i right. don't think right. I couldn't, couldn't name a clinic the protein clinic i mean what what's <laughs> medical what's medical about that but so how did the protein power book then come about and it's oh, kind wow. of strange we sat down in fact i just ran across this the other day because we're going through a lot of junk thrown it away but we had about <clears throat> probably five or six pages of Legal titles sheet. proposed for this book because nobody could come up with a title. His and original it, title was The Insulin Connection. Yeah, it was The Insulin Connection and the publisher says, yeah, yeah. everybody else think it's about diabetes. <laughs> yeah, everybody well, else think it's about it diabetes. There was a movie then, The French Connection. It was, that's kind yeah, of, there right. was. There and that's, was. that's why I liked it. And so, but they said, yeah, everybody will think it's about diabetes and they won't buy it unless they have diabetes. So anyway, we had this five or six pages of just one title after another. And uh, we sent them all off to the publisher, and the publisher went through all the. One of the titles was Protein Power, right. and the publisher picked that. And we were, strangely enough, kind of unhappy about it because mm -hmm. we thought a lot of the other titles were better. And um, and it just, you know, I mean, it had the alliteration, Protein Power, and all that. And as it turned out, it was a great title. And so they were smarter than I was. Well, they were. And, well, and, you dish, you, and you dish those very people today but um, in your newsletter. So uh, the thing about the protein power part was that everybody, you know, would refer to our diet as a high protein diet. And it's really not a high no. protein diet. It's a it's a amount of protein that you need diet, which is higher than a lot of people think. But uh, we were concerned that if it was called protein power, that we were just going to draw all kinds of fire for being, you know, recommending that people get on a high protein diet because everybody knows those high protein diets are going to croak your kidneys and, you know, cause cancer and God knows what else. And of course, none of that is true, but we didn't really relish going all over the country having to defend it. And as it turned out, they did ask questions about it, you know, the talking heads that had never read the book and that read the front cover of the, the fly jacket of the book. And then that's what they asked the questions on. But uh, they, uh, they did talk about it a little bit. And that's what we would always answer. It's not really a high protein diet. It's the amount of protein you need diet. Yeah. And which yeah. is more than most people get. Which is more than most well, people the, get. And so more than I think. Time has passed. And I think a lot of lawyers have been involved. The Verda company basically comes up with adequate protein now, mm -hmm. is the language, right? Adequate mm -hmm. protein. But it, you couldn't say fat power at the time, right? No, 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 no. At the time we'd have been ridden out of town on a rail if we'd have yeah. called it fat power. Although we did have some of the some of the titles involved fat. Yes, and uh, the suggestions that we had, but um but we did get that one a lot. Well it's just a high fat diet and you know ha what's the percentage of fat in this diet? And we both sat there knowing, oh it's 65, 70 percent and we're not gonna say that out loud because <laughs> right. these people will kill us if we yeah. say what's well, the 70 percent fat diet. You know, one time I was giving a talk at Colorado State University to a whole auditorium full of people. 
we'd been invited there by Lauren Cordain mm-hmm. and a couple of other guys on the staff. And so I was giving this lecture about it and, you know, we avoided this whole percentage thing uh, because basically I don't like percentages because mm-hmm. you don't eat percentages, you eat grams. Mm-hmm. But the um, I gave this talk and somebody asked that question from the audience and there was no, one, no way to escape it. And I hadn't even really, I knew it was high, but I hadn't thought about it. So I started thinking about how many grams of carbohydrates and what it was. And when I came out with that, probably about 65 to 70% fat. You can just see this collective. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but even then today, the language is, you know, healthy fats. And, you know, it's healthy fats. And and, I just go along with that. Of course, a natural fat is a healthy fat, but... But, right. you know, so there's this skirting around the idea that saturated fat is actually fine, but you can't say it. And it was, but so protein power was brilliant because it didn't, so it was between the rock and the heart. It went right through the yeah. language. Walking between the two fires, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, so um, time has passed. A lot, actually, a lot, a lot of research now. And, you know, have you changed your funnel? So, Let's say someone signs up for the Adopt Your Life Academy protein course. H- has there been any fundamental change in in your thinking over time, or, or a nuance, or does protein still come first? And and you know, don't worry too much about the rest. Yeah, I think I think in in that regard, I would even come down more strongly that protein comes first, uh, and that that you know, on a plate of food, it's got to be the center of the plate it's got to be the cornerstone of a meal and you put around it um anything from nothing if you want to go that extreme to um whatever amount of carbohydrate in in fruits and vegetables that you that your metabolism can withstand at that point and that may be different at different times it's certainly going to be different for different people um but the amount of protein that a given lean body mass needs is not going to change they need that much, and and they can stop there if that makes you know melts their if they're Sean Baker or you know I, I use him all the time because if it's big giant steaks he eats all the time but um, it, you can stop with just the protein if that's as far as you want to take it but um, just keeping the carbs low eating you know whole foods that are natural and most of what we said in protein power I think we we probably changed less on the protein part of it than we have on maybe the uh, the fats part of it and what fats would be um, the healthiest fats. I mean, we, we both knew that saturated fat was okay, but we didn't say it out loud a lot in the book. Right. Yeah, the, the time Go ahead and eat, eat butter and eggs, but don't talk about saturated fat. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody looks to see what's in the, in the butter. Well, so... Yeah. That's great. So now um, there's a lot of confusion today about protein and its effects in the body. I think one of the most common questions I get is the effect of, of protein and, and carbs on insulin and how uh, does the protein raising insulin, how that affects. Can you be knocked out of ketosis? Can all these harmful things? How do you look at the relative uh, effect of these macros on glucose and insulin how do you how do you see that today well i, I see it as um, um is is the whole idea is it's not a push phenomenon it's a pull phenomenon i mean protein can convert to glucose the gluconeogenic amino acids and protein can convert to glucose and, and that's what happens during gluconeogenesis so protein can definitely convert to glucose but it's not a push phenomenon you don't cause it by eating more protein it's a pull phenomenon you you pull it into action if you need more glucose. I mean, you got to have a certain range of glucose, and if it drops low, and you don't have anywhere to get it because you don't have any carbs or your your uh, glycogen is levels have diminished, and you need it from protein, then you pull it from protein. But by taking a lot of extra protein, you don't push it. There were a great study that I stumbled across I don't know, 20, 30 years ago that was done back in the 1930s at the University of Michigan where they took these um, medical students, actually. And that was a question that they had. And they fed them a huge amount of meat. um, And their blood glucose didn't change at all. 
And so they determined even way back then that you're not going to drive blood glucose level by eating protein. And then uh, what, what's her name? Gannon and um, oh, his Frank other Bell. research person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or her other research person. Yeah. Uh, you know, did a nice study about that a few years back that showed the same thing that you're really not going to push it. It's a, it's a pull deal. So I never worry about that, but for some reason, somebody went out and, and kind of started that rumor. And now a lot of people worry about that, but I don't think it's a worry at all. That is a worry with type one right. diabetics right. Uh, because they do have a problem with that. It can be a push phenomenon there. So they've got to cover it with insulin. So people that don't have type one diabetes, in my view, don't have to worry about it at all. Yeah, uh, excellent point. So, so don't worry so much about the protein that you're eating to satiety, the adequate protein, raising insulin too much, essentially. Don't worry right. about that. Yeah, it's going to be a, a medically type 1 diabetes issue. Um, for, for what is, so other things going on today, a lot has changed. You know, I, I was teaching basically what you teach and we studied it, the clinical trials, and published it. And someone came in and, and said, you know, oh, my goodness, you're teaching lazy, dirty keto. And, and I <laughs> thought, what is that? So, so this internet keto came out. You have to have super clean food. You have to have butter, bulletproof coffee. You have to have all the coconut oils and all these things. And so I started to learn about the internet kind of confusion out there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that people started coming in is I had to hit my macros. You know, I had to get this amount and this. And I was like, yeah. what are you doing? You know, so what of all the things, you know, do you have to calculate macros? And do you do you, has all this stuff been helpful or, or has it gotten us off track? What What are you thinking? I think for people who um, have a need to overanalyze and overmeasure things, it's probably wonderful because they can, you know, it's, it's measurable. I can make this many do this or you know it's like the people who really love the zone diet because it's just it, they can be very anal about making sure that they got their zone all matched up and if if that helps somebody stick to something and if they need that that's okay but honestly you know and we know you can hand them page four and if they'll do it it's going to be fine yeah so the the method we use goes you know back to the banting diet really you know mm -hmm. kind of, Funny to know it's kind of sad to see a lot of medical people conflate what we teach with the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. They're very different yeah. groups, very yeah. different, and and we don't focus. On, we don't focus on macro counting and all that. I mean, there were no apps 150 yeah. years ago. In fact, <laughs> I don't think there was. I don't think there was electricity even. So yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, but, uh, so a lot of people are concerned about that. A lot of people are wondering, you know, can they do the carnivore diet, which, you know, can be the extreme of, you know, wolves don't have coffee, so you can't have coffee. Or or, or it could be, you know, a little less extreme. But I'm curious because is there really anything in the vegetable matter that's not in the animal matter that you might eat? So you could get by just fine yeah. as, as, you know, as, as Johnson and, and colleagues proved back in the 20s, you can subsist perfectly fine and not become deficient in anything on a on a carnivore diet that has plenty of fat. You do need plenty of fat. You know, you need about 70, 30 or, or maybe 80, 20 um, fat to protein if you're just going to eat meat. And then you will use that protein to make blood sugar out of it. Um, but, um, you know, it's just, it's more for variety, I think, and than anything else. It's not necessarily, people have this, uh, this notion that there, you know, there's all these fabulous things in, in plants and there are, but a lot of them aren't even available to us because they're bound. Um, you know, the, the poor plant, uh, has to try to stop predation one way or another, and it has no claws or teeth and it can't run away. So it makes lectins and phytates and all these other things that uh, make it less good for us to eat. So, you know, we'd maybe say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't need to eat that. Um, but, we, you know, cooking has gotten around some of that and softened the fibers and made plants possible to eat. And certainly they can be tasty. But you can subsist just fine without them. Yeah. And getting back to your original question that you ask a lot of people, I mean, what are we made of? And when you're on a carnivore diet, you're eating what we're made of. 
I mean, one hundred percent what we're made of, and <laughs> that's the way I kind of explain it to people. And and uh, the um, uh, so you really can get by with it nicely, and I do it every now and then. The problem with it is it just gets a little bit boring, <laughs> and um, and I guess I haven't attuned my taste enough to where I don't want to eat anything but meat, but. When I do it for a, a period of time, I feel better. I sleep better. I mean, everything seems to get better. You know, I'll, I'll lose weight. But, um, but if you've if you've reversed a serious medical problem by mm -hmm. not eating vegetables, I mean, you'll have more of a reason. Oh, like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So it, it's fascinating to to see. Um, so so it looks like Mike, your story was one of personal use of the diet to find it. That's pretty common, and and there's a young medical student at Harvard now, Nick Norwitz, who basically yeah. fixed his his own ulcerative colitis, and you know I, I don't think he's going to say carnivore is boring, because there's nothing, there's nothing worse than nothing worse than a severe case of ulcerative colitis. If no. anyone no. gone through training, uh, so uh, you know if someone has cured. Uh, reversed is the language also that Verda use. I watch their language very carefully. You know, it's mm -hmm. adequate protein. It's reversing diabetes. Uh, and that's great. So now let, let's get into how much protein. A lot of questions I get. You know, can you eat too much protein so that you can't absorb it all like in one meal? Uh, you know, yeah. so that, that's a common myth out there. All right. Yeah. You can, you can so, I mean, yeah. you can, you can only actually probably make uh, use a, a certain amount for protein synthesis and beyond that it's just going to go into the amino acid pool and maybe not be used right away but you know you'll absorb it and you can use it and it's so satiating particularly if it's fatty protein that it's kind of hard to eat too much of it if you just eat to the satiety you're probably getting about the right amount that you need and you shouldn't worry about it and sort of the cohort that I always think of in terms of protein consumption or excess protein consumption are bodybuilders because right. they eat enormous amounts of protein, vastly more than any of us would ever think about eating. And they do it on a regular basis. And uh, as I always say to people who, you know, wonder if protein causes kidney problems, I say, you know, are there lines of bodybuilders at the dialysis centers? And there aren't. I mean, it doesn't bother their kidneys. They're able to process it just fine. And so I'm not sure, you know, what the, uh, there may be a limit on the, on the amount of protein that you can eat, but I don't know what it is. I think yeah. there's a limit to the amount that you can eat lean, uh, not necessarily in grams, but just you get, um, that, that happened with Stephenson. They put him on a very, very lean uh, mm -hmm. meat diet and he was getting so much protein and so little fat that it made him you know, kind of upset his GI tract and had some issues there. And basically he said to them, you've got to give me more fat. And so when they got the diet to about an 80, 20 percentage of fats, protein, then he gets fine. He was probably eating as much as he'd it'd been eating before, but he, um, well, maybe not quite because they were trying to keep his calories up. But um, it, it's not about, I, I think it's more about the balance there than it is about the protein itself. You know, I, I have a, I have a memory, and I, I just want for the people who are, who are just watching, of course, this is Dr. Mike and Mary Dan Eads, who wrote the book Protein Power, millions of copies sold. They've, they've been teaching ever since, and you've gone to meetings, you've given, given lectures on, based on all this, and I will never forget, I helped to bring a debate between, I think it, it was you, Mike, and Ron Rosedale. So now that low carb is set, you know, of course, I, this was, you know, if low carb is great, should it be low carb fo focused on focused on protein? Should it be low carb focused on fat? And it w was at that meeting. I, I can't even remember where I was where you showed this slide of nobody lined up at the dialysis center <laughs> from, from the bodybuilders. Yeah. And I thought of all the things that was just a little too harsh for me to to take. It was like it was charlatan. It was it was quackery. It was. But but it's the truth, you know. It, 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 you would find all these people having trouble, and then you know, so I would look for data on dialysis and bodybuilders, and found nothing. So anyway, you, you had a, a great way of of showing what was really happening in front of our faces, as opposed to what's supposed to <laughs> happen. 
And I, I think I remember Ron was really disorganized. I think he forgot all his slides that time. And, <laughs> and, and it was, he just talked off the cuff. So uh, anyway, again, thank you for, for teaching at, at our meetings and teaching me. Uh, and uh, let me get to some other questions. Um, Michelle says, asks, is it okay to have three scrambled eggs and one and one half scoops of unflavored whey protein isolate in water for breakfast? Three, three scrambled eggs and protein and water, not all together, I'm assuming. <laughs> Just three scrambled eggs and then some protein isolate and water. Sure. For breakfast, yeah. yeah. As a shake, yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, I, sure, if you, uh, if you don't want more eggs. Yeah, sounds, sounds reasonable. Um, Oh, someone asked me what is the local brisket in our area. It's city barbecue brisket. <laughs> I, I get no kickback, and it's just my personal favorite because the it's so fat inside, and the, mm. the edge is all mm. uh, anyway. I bet you cook a mean uh, Arkansas brisket. Mm -hmm. Arkansas. Brisket is good. Yeah, I like brisket because it is fatty. I love it. Uh, let's see. I was just reading the Arrow, a subscriber. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wait, what's the arrow? <laughs> That's his newsletter. <laughs> That's his weekly newsletter. Comes out every Thursday. What did somebody late say? In the the afternoon. best one that cut best Thursday afternoon newsletter. Fantastic. Like Fantastic. Yeah. And let's see, a lot of welcomes from all over the world and country. And let's see. Bob asks Dr. Eads's. Wanting to preserve as much lean body mass as possible as my wife and I age. So should we err to the upper side of recommended protein levels? Yes, sir. absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely should. And there's nothing, as, as we say all the time, your lean body mass is like uh, your IRA. That's your retirement account. Because uh, the bigger and more robust your lean body mass is, the... Um, more gracefully you're going to age and the healthier you'll be and the stronger you'll be both physically and cognitively uh, and the longer you'll live yeah, yeah it correlates with longevity and mm -hmm. it's just there's it's really incredibly important and it's difficult to do mm -hmm. and if you uh as you age and by age, age we mean like over 30. yeah <laughs> i mean it, it kind of 30 is a rough break point but somewhere you know in there and every year, every decade, it gets progressively harder to do. And you can lose muscle really easily if you're inactive. You can really lose it easily if you're hospitalized. And so it's always good to have a little bit extra. And you can, uh, you know, and the only way you can maintain protein mm -hmm. as you age or muscle as you age is to eat protein, good quality protein, mainly animal protein, eat a fair amount of it and do resistance exercise and if you do that you're gonna you're gonna have your muscle mass as good as it can be mm -hmm. and your bone mass and your bone mass because you remember, lean body is not just muscles right. either lean body is organs you know your your liver and your your lungs and your brain and your heart especially those those all are part of the lean body and your bones and your bones are built on a protein kind of a template so you need to have protein even for your bones you think of it as calcium but you really need protein and it's just i mean there's almost nothing more important as you age than maintaining your lean body mass and maintaining or building your muscle mass because when that's gone it is incredibly difficult to get it back i mean dr westman can vouch for he's taking care of a lot of sick people people in the hospital and when they lay there in bed for six or seven days languishing because they've got pneumonia or whatever, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot out of them, not just the disease, but just the muscle loss from inactivity. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's so important to have that reserve, that reservoir as you get older. And the only way you can do it is to keep your protein intake up and keep your, uh, and, and do resistance exercise. Work muscles against a load. Thanks. It can be a body weight load or it can be an iron load. Yeah. Your choice. Fantastic. Or a band uh, load. Judy asked, I was switching gears a little bit. And I have to say, watching, you know, I got into this for obesity treatment, and as a lot of us did, but I saw two, two of my patients did it. It wasn't my own personal journey, although I've used it ever since, the low carb keto diet. Uh, something that kind of popped up that, again, was sort of a relearning from the old was the cancer idea, the 
keto cancer and and that connection uh, and very interesting research going on today the question is are there any types of cancers that shouldn't be using a carnivore diet uh, to treat or, or you know as an adjunct or or once you've been diagnosed um, there probably are, but I can't, yeah, I couldn't I can't, tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, nor can I. And since I don't really know, I don't want to speculate. Yeah, sure. sort of I know some would do very well. Uh, you know, well, I gave you, gave you, being one, but. I gave you first crack at it. You know, I, I think, I don't know of any. I mean, the, the main thing you want to do is keep insulin low. Right. right? It's right. sort of the insulin, insulin like growth right. factor, those sorts of things. And then. Apparently, are a few cancers that that uh, mutations of them that can learn to use glutamate or some oh, other yeah. amino acid, and yeah. so you know those are ones that you'd really have to. You might go for that uh, ketogenic seizure ch ch children seizure diet and really keep right. protein low if that were the case. But um, but mostly, in, I mean, cancers love sugar. Uh, they grow on sugar. They are are fermentive. They've, they've lost their ability to respire and they ferment and they, they ferment sugar. And as a consequence, if you keep that away from them and keep your blood sugar low and feed yourself with, uh, with fat and turn it into ketones and let your brain and your heart and everything run on ketones, uh, then you kind of starve the cancer and that's the theory behind it. And I certainly, I can say for my part, if somebody told me tomorrow I had cancer, the first thing I'd do is go on a very low carb diet. I, I would immediately do that. And I'm, I live on a pretty low carb diet anyway, but yeah. which I think is, uh, I hope is going to keep me from ever having it. I don't know if that's yeah, true. But, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a complex and tricky thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, if, uh, you know, if I uh, did come down with cancer, I would put myself in the hands of somebody who's really skilled mm -hmm. in treating it with a ketogenic diet because yep. there are lots of, it's not just, oh, I got cancer, so I'm going to go on a ketogenic right. diet and, you know, live forever. There's a lot more to it than that. Right. Like a lot of nuances that, that have to be dealt with and, uh, you know, to do it all properly. I mean, not just the diet, there are drugs you can take, there are other things you can do. And so you, if, if you happen to be in that situation or if I did, I would get myself in the hands of someone who was really skilled at doing that. Mm -hmm. I think it's one instance where you might want to measure the blood ketones and, mm -hmm. and know, but uh, yeah. so much to learn about that. And, and, and cancer is such a, a insurmountable fortress that, in fact, when Jeff Volek at Ohio State, he was at UConn years ago yeah. and had done great research on low carb diets, he moved to Ohio State and, and they allowed him to kind of choose the topic that he wanted to study. And he, he, he just is studying a lot of cancer. And I'm like, Jeff, it's, you know, it's so, it's such a tough problem to fix, but they're, they're uh, looking at it and I'm humbled by just how difficult cancer is as a disease. Oh. I'm you know, much more cavalier about reversing diabetes, obesity, yeah. Yeah, GERD, you know, no problem, all those things. But mm -hmm. so uh, I think you're, Judy, you're getting the, the answer that th there's a lot to be learned. Uh, about yeah, and I, I do definitely think cancer is a, a metabolic disorder and not just a, uh, yeah. not a genetic, genetic disorder. Yeah. And I think that Definitely. you're going to have a lot more success treating it that way. Uh, but there's just a whole lot of work that's still left to be mm -hmm. done to really pinpoint exactly what to do. Yeah. So here's a quick uh, genie as keto or carnivore best for weight loss. Uh, well, I think. And honestly, um, probably carnivore will get you there a little faster if if you'll stick with it. I mean, if it's okay for you, I think it truly is probably faster. Because it's lower in carb. I would concur. Yeah. Because it's lower in yeah. carb. It's yeah. as low as you yeah. can go. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, kind of the conclusion that I came to a long time ago is that the, the vast engine of, of weight loss um, is – the carb restriction and you can do all kinds of different things but it's the carb restriction that does the, the heavy lifting mm -hmm. and you can fiddle around with the types of fat that you eat you can fiddle around with uh, you know everything you eat and do pure and do this and do that but it's the uh it's basically the the carb restriction that does the work and when, 
we had we're in practice we had all of our patients fill out uh, you know diet diaries and they would come in every week and we'd kind of review them especially if they were having a problem and you know some people just went on awful diets but what you consider awful diets in terms of what they ate as long as they restricted the carbs they seemed to do well and so to me that's the big engine and all these other things are just the uh, you know they're the trim tabs on the plane uh, the, the reducing the carbs or the big control surfaces on the plane that really make it do what you want it to do. And the trim tabs kind of help a little bit. So you, can, you can kind of get wrapped around the axle about whether, do I have to have grass-fed beef and do I, you know, all these little permutations? Does it have to be organic? Does it, you know, all of that stuff's nice, but truly, if you just get in the, when we wrote the book, The Protein Power Life Plan, which was the follow-up book in 2000 to Protein Power, uh, we set up these three different, what we call different um, uh, levels of um, devotion to commitment. of commitment to doing the diet. And the very first one we called the hedonist. And it truly was like page four from your book. It was just cut the carb. Get enough protein, eat the fat, <laughs> just cut the carb. I don't care what else you do. And then we had a, a real extreme end that we called the purist, the people who either needed because of some, you know, like people who uh, who might react to various lectins and plants and they have joint complaints or gut complaints or whatever. And so, uh, you know, getting really down to practically a carnivore diet, a very low carb, very pure diet might be important for them. And then there's those people in the middle, which we would call us most of the time, which we name dilettante. <laughs> because we, they they did a pretty good job at keeping their carbs down, but they did like coffee and wine, so they <laughs> they weren't purists. <laughs> and Irish whiskey. And Irish whiskey or Scotch. <laughs> but anyway, it uh, so that that was kind of three levels of uh, of commitment to uh, to how far you needed to go, and they all work. Yeah, that's excellent. So I uh, have a hello from the organizers of Low Carb Ottawa. Wendy and yeah. Arthur, hello. Hey, guys. Um, hey. Special shout out to meeting organizers. What a, you know, what a labor of love. It's so hard to do. Uh, uh, no doubt. Carol asks, Carol asks, in your book, Protein Power, you say that some people are sensitive to arachidonic acid in red meat and egg yolks. My blood pressure is being stubborn. Are there changes to your advice to determine whether this could be my problem? Um, I, <laughs> that's the, we're working on a redo of protein power. It's going to be called protein power 2.0. It's an upgrade. And, um, you know, we went back and went through it and, and just decided to rewrite the thing. And so we're in the, in the throes of doing that. The one chapter that I would definitely get rid of is that whole chapter on icosanoids and arachidonic acid and all that, because I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't think that's, I don't think in that's my proven view, valid. lived up to its billing. At yeah, that time, it, it didn't, I, didn't stand the test of time. Yeah. Right. And yeah. At that time, I was kind of under the evil influence of Barry Sears. <laughs> uh, Barry, yeah. we, we had been good friends with Barry for yeah, years and years and years. And he was pretty persuasive about that. And we were always on the lecture circuit with him at the same time. And so we would always go back and forth about it. And I listened to his lecture on icosanoids a million times. And so I thought, well, you know, that sounds reasonable. But the whole thing is, is all these, you know, all these pathways that you look at in the icosanoid sort of pathway from from the the raw materials to where you get down to the the things that actually do things, uh, th those are all, all these pathways are driven by either inhibited or enhanced by insulin and glucagon. So you can actually change all that just by lowering your insulin and increasing your glucagon. And you don't have to screw around with all the fatty acids and all that stuff, trying to get just the right mixture of this and that to, to get the proper end products, the, you know, the, the prostaglandins and prostacyclins that you're wanting to get. You can do all that just by keeping your insulin low so that's that's a chapter i would ditch so i don't know if that answers your question or not but yeah yeah I think. I would, you know there would be no reason not to go off of it just a, a an end of one trial go okay. off of it for three weeks eliminate it see if it makes a difference for you and if it does i'm not sure i know why but who cares if it makes a difference 
You know, this is the kind of advice for those listening from doctors who are in practice, who realize <laughs> that you're not taught everything in books. And, and internet influencers, <laughs> what it kind of just gets me is that internet influencers don't really, what they say doesn't have to work. And, or it only has to <laughs> no, work for a few right. people. And so, you know, uh, the idea of trying trial and error within, you know, within reason is something that certainly any clinical uh, practitioner mm -hmm. would have. That I love it. So Jennifer asks, I get back to protein. I eat 120 grams of protein daily, yet my blood work shows low protein. I wonder, let's say it was total protein or albumin. Uh, you know, how can I better absorb protein and what should she think about? Hmm. I, I wouldn't think it would be a matter of protein absorption myself. Uh, yeah. the, it's uh, animal protein, right? Right, plant protein. right. Or did you just say protein? I don't know, but let's say it's animal protein. Okay. Yeah, they have always, you know, that, that, That's a pretty good flaw. Yeah, for almost anybody, mm -hmm. uh, especially a female. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually, usually smaller, lean body mass. And, uh, you know, I would... <laughs> I would think it would be something, yeah, something not having to do with with protein absorption. Yeah, yeah. there may be something else, and I'm not yeah, sure so what that would be. Jennifer, I, I check in with your doctor on that mm -hmm. one, and you know I've learned that I, I get a certain chatter from my patients, and I'm sure you had learned from people you had seen. And if someone comes in with something that I've never heard before, I mm -hmm. kind of think to myself, "No, some, it's something else. It's not the diet doing it." Mm -hmm. you know? Right. Uh, and so I kind of have a good feel for what should be happening, like, you know, less bowel movements, yeah. less frequently, that yeah. sort of thing. But, mm -hmm. um, now, are you into the, uh, I just reviewed at my YouTube channel, I'm doing a lot of Reacts videos. They, they're they pretty popular where I, I'm calling out some just crazy people who say keto kills you. And I basically pick pick apart the argument or, you know, and say, where's the evidence for that? And, but there's one thing that, that did catch my eye. And that's the idea that the ferritin level can go up in people who eat carnivore specifically. And although I never, I've never systematically checked in my patients, the carnivore or the ferritin levels, but there's a, uh, First, what do you make of that? And what I'm thinking is that it really doesn't mean you have iron overload if your ferritin's yeah. high. Uh, but uh, have you seen that in your your yeah, practice? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't think so. I, what I would check first would be to see if they uh, uh, do a gene panel and see if they're um, heterozygous for uh, uh, hemochromatosis. Yeah. Because people who are heterozygous for that tend to uh, right, kind of right. store have elevated ferritin levels mm -hmm. that'd be the first thing i would check yeah. and the other thing that, that you have to remember about ferritin is that it is it's very volatile and if you have had a cold or a little anything like that a little infection of some sort um systemically and you get your ferritin levels checked they're going to be through the roof because your body sequesters ferritin uh, sequesters iron in the ferritin granules to keep it away from the bugs that are trying to make you sick and so um, even, you know, with just a virus, a stomach virus or a head cold or something like that, um, your ferritin is not going to re reflect your actual stores of iron. And that's why you probably need to get not just the ferritin, but a total iron, iron binding capacity, that whole panel so that you kind of make sense of it. Because then you can see, oh, this ferritin has yeah. been pulled into the granules. I mean, this iron has been pulled into the ferritin granules to get it away from whatever was invader was trying to uh that's just a part of the normal immune system. and yeah and that uh, check the you know the genetics for uh for hemochromatosis, hemochromatosis. Yeah. Yeah. and you know the, that you know that's just you know, common enough that most doctors don't know what to do it's yeah right yeah um, yeah and one of the things too you check it regularly yeah. in the patients one of the Apparently. yeah that was part of our regular blood panel but one of the things that um you know that i thought of a, a while back is that um now, giving blood is good for you. There are a lot of there are a lot of studies out there that show. I mean, I don't think there are, you know, not many not definitive studies, but, but people who who give blood seem to be healthier and live longer. And I don't know if that's just that's an, a, kind of the healthy user effect because healthy people tend to do that more than non-healthy right. people. But anyway, 
I don't think giving blood hurts you and it's going to help a lot of other people. And if you do have a little bit of an iron problem, that's going to, that's going to solve it. And when I got to thinking about that, you know, I thought, you know, in, in ancient days in our Paleolithic ancestors, and that's when we cut our genetic teeth. I and mean, we've just been the way we are now for a, an eye blank of time. And main, mainly our, our genes have been laid down over the millennia where we were Paleolithic man and ate a lot of meat were scavengers, didn't get a lot of carbs. And so we uh we, we had to we have get a lot of yeah, we, we had to yeah, we had to have a way to store and, and cling on to iron because we got cut, we got dinged, we got parasites, mm -hmm. and those were all going after our blood. So we had to develop this system to really cling on to it. And when I thought of that, I went back and started looking at some papers. And if you go and you look at chimpanzees, you look at orangutans, you look at all these animals in the wild, they all have parasites. Mm -hmm. And so there's no reason that early man wouldn't have had parasites and parasites generally carry your blood with you. And so, <laughs> and so now fun. since we don't have parasites, we've got clean water and we live in sanitary conditions and we're not eating, uh, eating up with one kind of worm or another, it probably is a good thing to give blood. And that's the way I reasoned it out. And when you look at the data, it appears that that's the case. And in my view, that's the reason. So um, and I would give blood if I had elevated ferritin and I checked everything out and there didn't seem to be a problem. And even just give blood, even if you don't have elevated ferritin, if you're not low, because it's the one thing that you can do that is always a life-saving thing for somebody else. I think a, a, a renewable resource. <laughs> oh, and one other thing about the, the, the ferritin, I mean the carnivores, I am, believe I remember, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, Mike, I believe I remember that heme iron is not absorbed in the intestine if, they're, if their iron stores are replete. Yeah, you is can, that true? You can regulate of your absorption of heme iron, whereas you can't regulate your absorption of um, inorganic, inorganic iron. iron. So if you get iron-fortified foods, and that's a problem we have because back in the day, people didn't get enough meat, so they fortified all these things, and they've continued to fortify them with iron. And so you can't really shut that off, but you can, you do have some control on whether or not you are going to absorb heme iron. Which yeah. is in meat. Yeah, That's which really, is the type of iron in meat. Yeah. Um, getting back to kind of that, now that low carb is a good idea, how do you look at the protein and fat that you eat, the ratios? Can you optimize it? Is, uh, are you really concerned about it? Uh, what What do you think we've learned over the last few decades? Uh, well, I'm, I don't think about it. I mean, if you if you have a, <laughs> a, a good chunk of meat in your meal, you're going to be fine. I love it. And yeah, so there's, there's the a lot of obsession, a lot of obsession about fine tuning. Yeah, and uh, I think, I, 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 like with the. With the grass-fed beef and those things, I think you you can certainly fine-tune all you want, but but I would say that you you get an amount of protein that is enough to nourish your lean body mass, and it's going to be at the high end of a range if you're older for sure, or if you're very young and growing, you need plenty of protein. But um, you need to get fat, and then the rest of what you eat is to satiation for fat. Just you know have enough calories, mainly of fat calories that you feel satisfied with that meal and, you know, throw in a little colorful stuff. If it doesn't bother you, take it out if it does. I mean, it's just kind of infinitely adjustable to your own needs. Uh, but for most people, it's just, you know, give me, give me the steak and give me the salad and give me the green vegetable and off I go. I mean, if you think about it, you get right down to it. I mean, what we need to survive is we need, you know, we need stuff. We need vitamins and minerals. We need nutrients. And protein is a nutrient, and we need calories just to fuel our activity, to, to fuel life. And so fats are, are calories, and proteins are I mean, fats are calories, and carbs are calories, but protein is a nutrient. It has you've calories. Got, right, it has it calories, but you've got to have the protein because it does something for you, whereas fat and, and calories, basically, I mean, there are a few right. essential fatty acids that you get, but those are, you don't know, really ever have to worry about those if you eat fat. Uh, but but fat and protein are basically just calories. I mean, they're just fuel for the engine. That wrong. Fat and carbs. Or I'm sorry, fat and carbs are basically just calories, fuel for the engine. 
but protein is a nutrient and that's why it's so incredibly important that you make sure to, to get the right amount and all this fine tuning geez when we used to run around with, with barry sears uh you know he came we were all writing books at the same time and he came out with his own first and so we continued on our lecture adventures with him all over the country at the time and we had him, protein power wasn't even out yet. We were doing it based on my first book. And we moved it also over to a new publisher. Yeah. And, and we got moved to a new publisher. You know, all kinds of things happened. But anyway, we. So he and, got out and so when we would go around and we would talk, then all these people would come up with us, cause, to us, because they, they were intimidated to talk to Barry. And they would say, <laughs> you know, I found out this great way that you could make ice cream zone favorable if you take one scoop of ice cream and you put six almonds in it it's zone favorable and and you know and so they were always trying to <laughs> to fiddle around with that and make it come out 40 30 30 by you know adding a little bit of this and taking a little bit of that away but you know you, trying to make muscles zone favorable yeah i mean it's just crazy you know because because if you do you eat them with something else and so it, it just, they don't count. yeah and so somehow so, i just thought all that was insane all that fiddling and fine tuning so just to uh say again you're listening to two doctors well three now <laughs> myself who've worked with people across a wide range of of means and and ability to to find food and 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 what they eat and choose to eat and and you're so you i hope you're getting reassured that there are a million ways to go about this and to be healthy. And, and I'm often just kind of shocked that, you know, we have kind of like a, a slow cooker. It's called our stomach, you know? <laughs> and you know, nobody has a problem with a slow cooker. You put it in there and you leave it all day. And, and you know, but so, you know, the timing of things, some people teach this, like you have to have an IV and have glucose in every minute of the day, like like you're hooked to a, a gas station pump with your car going, you know, the body has a way of figuring it out if you get out of the way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And often what we're doing is taking away the, the bad fuel, if you will, and carbs, too much carbs in the in the wrong hands can be a problem. And, and uh, and I guess my, my point is that the more people you deal with, the more relaxed you get about it because you've seen people yeah. do it so many ways, right? right. right. And, and the more you realize that the real engine is the carb restriction. Right. Right. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, and, and what people don't understand is a lot of people don't understand, you know, you talk about gluconeogenesis, making carbs from protein, uh, or really any of these processes in the body that go on. They're all going on all the time. It's not okay. I'm 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 generating glucose right now, and in 20 minutes I'll stop and I'll do. It. It's just it's all going on all the time. Right. And so when you when you try to fool around with it, it's kind of I mean pointless. If you just cut the carbs, and eat plenty of protein, um, fat. and and good quality fat, you're going to do fine. You're going to lose weight. And you're going to do well. Fantastic. And, I mean, you you can tweak it. But, but you know, you, you, and you may get a few percentage points of improvement, but the main improvement you're going to get is by cutting the carbs and making sure you got plenty of protein okay. and fat. Yeah, you know, well, you got to have the fat. I mean, you got to either have carbs or fat, you got to have yeah. calories somewhere. Yeah, fantastic. And so, as I, I started, you've been teachers for me. Thank you so much. It's my great pleasure to announce that the protein course that you two wrote for the Adapt Your Life Academy is now open for enrollment. So if you go to adaptyourlifeacademy.com, you can click on getting more information or even enrolling in the protein course right now. Uh, can you describe a little bit about the protein course, what someone might get out of it? Oh gosh, yeah. Uh, well, you'll find out all about uh, protein quality and where you look for foods with the best protein quality, what those are. Uh, you'll find out about how to determine how much you need uh, of protein, how much you need to eat per meal, per day, per whatever. Uh, we'll attack a number of the myths of too much protein. We'll definitely get into the vampire myths, Mike calls them. We'll go uh, through all of those. 
And we'll take a little spin through uh, from Paleolithic times forward and talk about um, kind of uh, man's quest for protein over the years and, and how that was sort of uh, uh, written into our genome from the get-go. Uh, and then what else do we talk about? Yeah, you know, the, the different ways that people categorize protein. Right. Uh, right. How do you determine protein quality? Yeah. yeah. And all the different ways people try to determine it over the the years, because it's really been a struggle because of this difference between plant right. protein and or animal protein and plant, plant protein. protein. Mm -hmm. and, There's a lot. It's yeah. everything you ever wanted to know about protein. Yeah. We're afraid to ask. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know. As I'm watching, I'm just um, mesmerized by your ability to teach. And having previewed the course, there are, I think, 16 videos of you guys giving the content with slides that you've put together ahead of time. So there's a, a, a content that you access immediately once you sign up for the course. And then there are also live sessions. So just like this, you can ask questions live based on what you've learned in the course. And then there are PDFs of those videos. So if you're someone who likes to read while you watch a video, Adapter Life Academy has this desire to allow you to learn in whatever way you learn best. So again, it's my great pleasure to, and thank you for putting in the effort to do this. I, I think it's gonna teach a lot of people, probably one of the best things that I've learned from the course is the difference between animal and plant proteins. You know, the, the idea that uh, it's not all the same ilk. That's right, they're not created equal. Yeah, and, and uh, I think, well, that, I'm sorry I couldn't get all, to all of the, uh, to all the questions, there still a few remain, but I think I got the high points and I wanna be respectful of your time tonight, thank you so much again, not only for tonight, but for your your teaching through the years. Uh, and I can't wait to see you guys again in person. Yeah, same here. We look forward to it, Our pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank so you. Don't, don't forget, adaptyourlifeacademy.com. The protein course is now open for enrollment. I, I highly recommend this course. It, it's just chock full of information. And, and you, you talked about the Egyptian mummies. I, I knew you would. That's one of my <laughs> best lectures. The best lectures. I don't want to spoil the, the, the spoiler alert, but the Egyptian <laughs> mummies had atherosclerosis. They did. They did on a bread <laughs> diet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks again. You bet. Bye now. Take care. Bye-bye.